So can you see my screen fine? Yeah, it looks good. Okay. So let me turn the lights on. It's, uh, okay. <laughs> so actually, our, our graduation ceremony is today. Oh. And, uh, and the mayor of Chicago is speaking, so I am... Uh, oh, that's nice. Yeah. But how it's, people are just all connected, like it's a webcast or something? Yeah, that's right. It's a webcast. Okay. But are they going to go ahead and read out the names of all of the no. graduating students? No. Oh, they're not. Oh, that's too bad. So the different departments are doing different events. So we had a physics event. So we did read out the names of the students there. And uh, th they're also going to try to do something next year. So there's a, anyway, we'll see how that's going to work out. Yeah, we're also having like, there's a faculty of science sort of mini event. And then we're going to have a physics event as well. Like, just by Zoom. Yeah, we had one. Uh, the physics event was yesterday, so and it was fine. Uh, mm. It was brief, uh, which is probably a good thing <clears throat> for everybody. Yeah, yeah. It was weird, but it was better than I thought it would be. So that's that's good. That's good. That's good. I don't know if you've seen the, there was several, a, well, a few years ago, there was a, um, a segment made on a Canadian kind of comedy news show um, of Art McDonald talking about neutrino flavors. Um, I, I, put, I put the link to that clip in the, in the Slack channel. Well, I saw that you posted yeah. something. I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, it's a video, so you, we can't really watch it during the lecture, but. You know, afterwards people can. <laughs> someone, someone already put a crying, crying happy <laughs> icon <laughs> next to it. <laughs> yeah, he's sort of a Canadian celebrity, I, I, of some sort. Oh, he's a huge celebrity. You know, it's like anytime, anytime. I don't know. Anytime another part of the world mentions Canada, it's news in Canada. <laughs> Yeah, he's also a very nice guy, so that, that helps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Probably give people another minute or two. Okay. We're at, we're at 38, 39. Right. Yeah, I guess, you know, Friday is a harder, you know, people are starting to get tired, I, I, I suspect. Yeah, 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 yeah. I guess next week the program is very different, so hopefully that will be good. I mean, the, the types of topics will be very different. Mm -hmm. so, so the hope is that that will give people a little bit of a boost. Right. I guess, yeah. Yeah, next week is much more collider-oriented, let's say. Yeah. Plus other, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the quantum information stuff. I'm actually mm -hmm. kind of looking forward to that because that's something I know very little about. Yeah, I'll, I'll probably have to miss that. There's the, the big neutrino conference is next, starts next week. Ah, uh, right, 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 yeah. And, and it's a virtual conference, but mm -hmm. it's all in the morning. So they've, they've stretched it out. Mm, the okay. Is on the morning Chicago time. Is it so that people in Europe? Accommodate all the different time zones. Right, I see, yeah, 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 yeah. I think it's from, in our time, it's from like seven to 12. Ooh, okay. Which I guess is for, it's, it's make it for like people in California. Oh yeah, no kidding. <laughs> oh my in the morning. gosh. Uh, and then people uh, but in, I guess in, in Europe. Japan, yeah. Yeah. Well, you also have to but go all the way to Japan, so that's far yeah, away. Yeah, in Japan, that's oh, but I guess then it's like the evening, the evening. Yeah. I so guess it could be worse. That, yeah, yeah. It, it ends around two in the morning or something. <laughs> right. Jeez. Oh but at gosh. least you know, yeah. but everybody in between is is okay. So mm -hmm. that, that was the goal. Yeah, Hawaii is screwed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, maybe we should get started. Um, so we're already a few minutes late. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so uh, our second lecture of today will be Andre de Govea's final lecture on neutrino mass models. And please take it away. Okay, so uh, 
after a long break, we're going to come back to talking about neutrino mass models. Uh, and uh, today, I'm only going to talk about the hypothesis that the neutrinos are Majorana fermions. And then I'll talk about how do we build models that give neutrinos a non-zero mass if they happen to be Majorana fermions. So this is, uh, this is what I'll talk about for this hour and uh, 15 minutes or so. And I will take advantage of the fact that different speakers have mentioned bits and pieces of this. And uh, hopefully, uh, we will be able to tell a story uh, that has a beginning and an end. OK, so we want to talk about Majorana neutrinos. And again, <clears throat> our, our goal is to have after electric symmetry breaking, a term in the Lagrangian that includes something that has a two neutrinos in it. So that's what we're striving to get after electric symmetry breaking. And, and I think I mentioned this uh, in the last lecture, uh, neutrino masses have to go through electric symmetry breaking because the neutrinos are part of the lepton doublet. Right, which in our language looks like that. And remember that for the most part, I'm pretending that there's only one generation. <clears throat> so basically, this is the object that we have in the standard model, which is a lepton doublet. And uh, we want to try to construct a, a bilinear out of that. I want to very briefly talk about this. So if I look at an object that looks like this, so it's the product of two Ls. Remember, in this uh, language that we're using, these are two fermions. I mean, it's a, it's a collection of fermions, but I can look at the fermion contractions of this or the Lorentz structure of this, and this is definitely a Lorentz singlet. So that's good, uh, but it's bad in other ways. Uh, it has hypercharge, and the total hypercharge is minus one. So this is clearly not gauge invariant. And if for some miracle you don't particularly like hypercharge, uh, we can also look at the SU2 structure of that. Uh, this is an isospin a half. This is another isospin a half. <coughs> so these are two doublets. And if we wanted to make this into a, a, an isospin singlet, we have to take those two doublets and we have to form a singlet out of, out of that. Again, so that means from the isospin point of view, uh, I have to combine those two uh, uh, isospins into a singlet. And the way to do that is the anti-symmetric combination. So it would be a combination that goes like, uh, as we've been talking about a lot, it's the one that goes like uh, up, down, minus, down, up. And it turns out that that's zero. Okay, and I'm, I will leave this as an exercise for the non-believers, but you can convince yourself that if you take LL, and you make that into an isospin, whoops. Isospin equals zero. This is actually zero. Okay, and uh, again, this is a homework problem if you don't believe me. And if you're very picky, <clears throat> you can show uh, but first of all, this statement is true because fermions anti-commute. Okay, so you want to go through that exercise. And you can extend that by adding more generations. And if you have more generations, it turns out that this particular combination is anti-symmetric in flavor. And there's a reason I'm talking about this, and I'll come back to this in probably five or ten minutes. Okay, so that's just a, just a point of information about this particular combination LL. So with this in mind, uh, there's another combination that I can write down, which is this one, LH. And from the hypercharge point of view, this is good. And again, this is also a doublet. I don't know why I'm calling the doublets one half. I, I could, but it's confusing. So let me call them twos because uh, that helps. So this is a doublet of, of SU2. The Higgs is another doublet. We know how to combine uh, two doublets into an isospin singlet. 
And here, the L and the H are different fields. So I can definitely combine that into an isospin equals zero. So this is good. That means that LH is actually gauge invariant. Now the problem is it's not Lorentz invariant. It's actually a Lorentz spinner. And that's easy to see because the, you know, the lepton doublet is a spinner and the Higgs is a scalar. So if I combine those two, uh, then, then, then that's what I get. So there's a question here in the chat. The thing I'm confused by is that when, you, when we do a similar thing with Lorentz contraction of a vial spinner with itself, we don't get zero because of the anti-commuting nature. And yet we get zero when we do that with the weak isospin doublet. So those two things are actually, uh, uh, this, they, they're combined with one another. <clears throat> so remember if I take uh, uh, the L and the L and I want to make that into a, a, a Lorentz singlet, then that combination is already anti-symmetric. And of course, the reason that that doesn't vanish is because the fermions anti-commute. So even though the Lorentz structure is anti-symmetric, when I remember the fact that the, the, the fermions anti-commute, that works out fine. And if I want to make a, an isospin singlet out of that, I have to add another thing which is also anti-symmetric. So if you look at the structure of the whole thing, it vanishes. So if, it, if these things were not fermions, so for example, if these things were scalars, you know, if I wanted to write down HH, I can do that. So HH is the same story. The question is, can I take two H's and make uh, uh, an isospin singlet out of that? Uh, I have to go through the math and see how that works out. But, but it's because the L's are, so the whole story is because the leptons are fermions and because I am combining them into a fermion, into a, a a Lorentz singlet, if I on top of that try to make it into an ISO singlet, then the whole thing is anti-symmetric, so it vanishes. So hopefully that's more clear. And again, I, like I said, this is a homework problem. Uh, it, I, it's not meant to be trivial, uh, but it is something that hopefully everybody can sit through and think about. Okay? Or if you want to think about it in a, in, in a different way, if you look at the Lorentz structure, the LL is already the right thing, you know, it already lives in the Lagrangian. If on top of that there's something else that makes that be anti-symmetric, then, then it vanishes. Okay, so that's the, so hopefully that helps. Okay, so again coming back to LH, LH is a spin a half object, so of course, and this is something that you have seen before, if I write down this combination here, this is totally fine. This is a gauge invariant and it's Lorentz invariant. And, and in my language, that's how I write this. It's LH, LH, and everything is contracted according with the rules. So the L and the H form an isospin singlet, and then the L and the L, yeah, by the way, the HH also vanishes as well. So yes, that's correct. Uh, that's why we don't write, well, it also has hypercharge, so it's not even gauge invariant. But you're correct, yeah, HH is also, gauge, is also zero. So this uh, LH, LH operator is uh, completely fine. And the only thing it doesn't have going for it is that this is a dimension five operator. So I'm going to write it this way. So if I wanted to write down a dimension five operator that is gauge invariant and it's made out of standard model fields, I would write something that looks like this, okay? And I want to talk a little bit about this particular effective operators, and I want to talk about what effective operators mean and, and why people get excited about effective operators. So again, the first comment, which is very important, is if I take this uh, LH, LH operator, And I ask what does this look like after electric symmetry breaking? It looks like uh, neutrino neutrino Higgs Vev squared over lambda with a one half here. And this is exactly a neutrino Majorana mass. It's one half neutrino Majorana mass nu nu, where the neutrino Majorana mass is a V squared over lambda. 
So lambda is the coupling associated to this operator. And uh, we have no idea what it is, but we know it's dimension full because again, this is a higher dimensional operator. And uh, people get super excited about this result. And there's a lot of reason to be super excited about this result. And the reason is the following. I can write this out as V times V over lambda. And if lambda is way bigger than V, remember V is the Higgs value up to a factor of square root of two that I don't care about. Uh, and again, I didn't tell you what V is in this particular step. So it is whatever gives the right answer. Uh, but this is the weak scale. So if lambda is much, much bigger than the weak scale, then neutrino masses are parametrically small. relative to all the other masses in the standard model. And again, the, the, the key feature of the standard model that, that hopefully people appreciate, which is very important, is that it is a single mass scale model. It doesn't look like it because of all the UCA couplings that are kind of all over the place, but all of the masses in the standard model are proportional to the Higgs boson vacuum expectation value, which is really neat and very nice. So it is a single scale model. So a typical mass is of order V times some number, and we have no control over that number. But what this equation here is telling us, this one, is that the neutrino masses are not V, uh, but they are expected to be a lot smaller as long as this is satisfied. So if you want, uh, just by staring at this and saying, look, if the neutrino masses are manifest via this higher dimensional operator, I can make a prediction. And the prediction is that the neutrino masses are parametrically small. If you stare at the data, that's exactly what the data look like. The neutrino masses, as I try to emphasize, and I noticed that Lisa also talked about that, are parametrically small. Or that they're very small relative to all the other masses. This is the reason why if you go around talking to your theory friends and you're placing bets on how neutrinos get a mass, almost everybody really, really likes the, the idea that the neutrino masses are a consequence of this operator. Somehow something happened and that's the operator that, that gives neutrinos a non-zero mass. And the main reason is that it explains why the neutrino masses are so small relative to all the other masses that we know about. Again, that's not a scientific statement. It's sort of a gut statement. Gut as in not a grand unified theory, but uh, something that you feel is right, uh, given your experience. Uh, but of course, nature has to tell us if this is the right answer or not. OK, so this is the story. Uh, I forgot to mention, but this is very important. Um, this operator often has a name. It's called the Weinberg operator. The reason is Weinberg doesn't have too many things named after him yet, so we have to give him an operator too. The reason for that is uh, he was the first one to bring it out, bring it up in a, in a very, very nice paper in 1979. So uh, it's very important. And in the language, people either call this a dimension five operator or they also call it the Weinberg operator. Okay, what's interesting about this operator and, and the other thing I want to mention, which of course, you know, Ben just gave you some very nice lectures on this, is that it breaks B minus L by two units. And a consequence of this is that the neutrinos are Majorana fermions. Oop. And this is something that we can test experimentally. And I'm not going to talk about that at all because we just had two lectures on that. OK. So there's another homework problem that I want to give you, which is uh, I'll write it in red because it's a super nice thing about. Uh, so again, uh, there's a fun thing, which is if you only have the standard model, and keep in mind that the new C does not exist. 
Okay, so if you take the standard model particle content and you start writing down gauge invariant uh, operators. So if you stop at dimension four, you will get the standard model Lagrangian. If you ask, what kind of operators can I write down which have dimension five? And the answer is you can only write down one. So there's one dimension five operator. And then there are many which are dimension six and higher. Which is kind of an exciting statement to make. And, and, and I'll come back to why this is exciting. Uh, so the homework problem I want to give you is the following. So this uh, dimension five operator breaks lepton number by two units. And the question is, let's say I want to write down a different operator that breaks lepton number by two units. Can I do that? The answer is absolutely. And there's a fun thing that happens is uh, if I have delta L equals two, then it turns out that these operators are all odd dimensional. And if the operator is even dimensional, then it either doesn't break lepton number or it breaks lepton number by four units. This statement actually extends to baryon number. If you want to break actually B minus L by an even number that's not divisible by four, then the operator has to be odd dimensional. If you want to break it by uh, uh, a number which is divisible by four, including zero, then the operator is even dimensional. I'm not going to show that, uh, but it is a nice homework. Uh, it only requires that you understand the quantum numbers of the particles in the standard model. And by the way, there's another interesting comment, which is uh, if you want to violate lepton number by one unit or baryon number by one unit, you can't. It's not possible. You can violate B minus L by two units, which violates baryon number by one unit and maybe L by one unit but you can't just violate L by one unit and not violate baryon number and vice versa. And again, if this sounds weird, it's pretty weird, uh, but it's true. Okay, so I wanna spend one minute talking about higher dimensional operators. There are gonna be lectures on this next week, but the idea is basically the following. So if I write down an energy scale here, let's say here's the weak scale. And here's some new physics, which is heavy. So right here's some M nu. And if I'm only doing experiments here, and I want to ask, what does this new physics do for me? I can capture everything that the new physics does with these higher dimensional operators. So that's why we really like higher dimensional operators. It basically says, look, I believe in new physics somewhere at some very high scale, but of course I can't do experiments at those very high scales. I only get to do experiments at very low scales. So if I ask what could the new physics do, whatever that new physics is, it will manifest itself via higher dimensional operators. Okay, if you press me, I am sure I can come up with exceptions to that. But as long as the new physics doesn't do weird stuff like uh, violate uh, uh, Lorentz invariance or violate the CPT theorem, then the statement is correct. Okay, so that's super exciting. And that's why we really like higher dimensional operators. And that's why we really like the Weinberg operator, which I'm going to write lots and lots of times. So if I stare at this higher dimensional operator, it is basically telling me that if this is how neutrinos get a mass, then we can say with very, very, gen very generally that there has to be some new physics somewhere, which at low energies manifests itself via this high dimensional operator. Okay. And again, if you talk to your other more senior theory friends, that's why they are very excited about non-zero neutrino masses. Now, the next question is what can we learn about this uh, new physics scale? And that's where it gets tricky. So like I said, you know, the neutrino mass is a V squared over lambda. That means I can calculate what lambda is supposed to be. That's V squared over the neutrino mass. And if I plug in numbers, that's about 10 to the 14 
GED. What does that mean? And this is a thing which is uh, important to appreciate. And uh, strictly speaking, this means the following. It means there is new physics. There's some, there's a new mass scale. And that mass scale is at most order lambda. And the key thing is this at most, okay? This is the best we can say without having a lot of prejudice. Everything else we can say has prejudice. So saying this in a different way, this m nu is less than lambda. And then there's a question. You're assuming order one coupling constants in dimension five operator. Uh, that's a tricky question. And the answer is no, because uh, at least as, as it's defined here, lambda is the coupling. I don't have to define two couplings for one operator. That's, uh, that, that's not necessary. Okay, so lambda is that coupling, which is why I can say what lambda is. What you're asking is what's M? And the answer is we don't know. We just know that it's less than about lambda. It could be way less than lambda if the theory is weakly coupled, but it could be of order lambda. We know for sure it's not bigger than that, or it's not much bigger than that. And, and I will discuss that in an example. So is that, is that kind of clear? And we can come back and talk about this later. Okay, so this is where we are. And again, I, I do wanna say, and I'll write this in some other color. And this is the important thing. We don't know if this is true. And it's always important to keep in mind Okay, that's why we really care about uh, uh, asking uh, what are the physics consequences of this operator. One consequence is that the neutrino mass is not zero. That's good. Another consequence is that the neutrino is a Myron or fermion. That's good because that's something we can in principle learn in the laboratory. But that's, that's it. That's everything we can learn from this higher dimensional operator. In order to learn more, we need to talk about the UV completion. which is higher dimension operators are great. You can learn a lot from them, but, but they're not a panacea. That means you can't learn everything from higher dimensional operators. Uh, you, you, need, you need to do better. And I always like to give an example of something we're very familiar with, of uh, higher dimensional operators and their limitations and what, what we can learn from them. So there's a question in the chat. We can also contract LLHH. The answer is no, because LL is zero. And as somebody else mentioned, HH is also zero. So very sadly, this is zero times zero, which is fine, but it's not useful. That's why we always talk about this LH, LH contraction. And again, this is part of your homework problem is to convince yourself that everything that I've said just now is correct. Or you can prove me wrong. So either way you win. So let me talk about an example which is the charge current weak interactions early on, or the Fermi theory. So one thing which we all know about is uh, when people discover the muon and they have to describe how the muon decays, after a lot of work and a lot of time and a lot of confusion, they figured out up to a factor of square root of two, which I can't remember, that this is the Lagrangian that describes muon decay. It's a dimension six Lagrangian. So G Fermi, it turns out, is a one over the Higgs VAB squared. If you write down the right value of the Higgs VAB, which is 246, 
And remember, I'm forgetting this factor of square root of two. And this is a higher dimensional operator. It is great. We can do lots of things with that. We can calculate the mu on lifetime very precisely. That's actually the best possible measurement we have of G Fermi. And Iris talked about that in the first week. And uh, it's a great theory. But of course, it's a higher dimensional operator. And if you start asking yourself, so if we go back in time and we learn about this Lagrangian, what do we learn? We learn that there's new physics with some new mass scale, which is less than or, or of order 246 GeV. This is a prediction you can make. And I will spoil the surprise. We actually found new physics. There's this thing called the W boson that has a mass of about 80 GeV, which is less than 246. And that means that this works. And uh, we had to find the, Higgs, the W boson in order to start saying more about what this theory is. Otherwise, there are too many uh, uh, options going around. If you go back and you look at the history of this charge current interactions, there's a very interesting, very exciting history of people spe speculating about the UV complete theory of uh, the weak interactions. So uh, there's another question in the chat. Will this 10 to the 14 GeV also set the characteristic scale of reheating temperature? Uh, again, the only statement I'm allowed to make is that the new physics scale is at most of order lambda. That's all I can say from measuring non-zero neutrino masses and from believing that they happen in this way. That's the only thing I'm allowed to say. Uh, I think the question you're asking is, is it related to some uh, symmetry breaking? Uh, we have no idea. Or is it just the mass of some new particle? It could be. But I think that we, you know, we want to speculate as little as possible for as long as we can get away with it. OK. Good. OK, so coming back to the weak interactions, I do want to remind you of the fact that when people wrote this theory down, which was a long time ago. This is the Fermi theory written by the real Fermi. Uh, they weren't thinking about things in this language, you know, that, that there has to be some new physics which has a mass of about the inverse of the Fermi constant squared. But very early on, people started looking for the W boson. Okay, and this is pretty early on. So one thing you people look for, so there are bounds on the W boson from things like uh, K plus going to pi zero W plus, for example. So you can look for the W boson that way. And if you do it, you'll be very disappointed. It doesn't happen. And using that, you can say that the W boson mass is bigger than the K on mass, for example, roughly speaking. And we looked for the W boson that way. And the reason it was not crazy to do that is because the W boson mass could have been 100 MeV, or it could have been you know, 10 KeV, or it could have been 1 GeV. And we don't know because all we knew from the effective theory was G Fermi. And G Fermi is 1 over the Higgs boson VAB squared. And it only tells us how large can the W mass be? It doesn't tell us how small it could be. And it could have been very different, OK? OK, that's all I want to say about this. So, oh, OK. So just to continue the story, the story is, uh, so we have the Weinberg operator, which I will highlight once again. And it allows us to make some predictions. One is neutrino masses are different. And the other one is neutrinos are Majorana fermions. And if you want to make progress, or if you want to do anything else, uh, you need to talk about UV completions of the Weinberg operator. So that's what we're going to talk about. OK, so that's the next step 
And that's where all of, all of the model building goes, is, uh, is in a UV completions of the Weinberg operator. And I will talk about the standard ones, and that's all I'll probably have time to talk about. And uh, I, I don't have a discussion this afternoon, but I'll be at the E room in the coffee break, and people can ask me about other stuff as well. So the first thing I want to talk about is what's called the, the type two seesaw. And the reason I want to talk about that is because uh, Again, I, I, I want to emphasize this. We need new particles. And uh, that's what the effective operator is telling us. If there is an effective operator, there is some new particle that lives at some different mass scale. So let's start talking about new particles. One thing we can appreciate is we can go back to this uh, LL that we were talking about. And remember I saying I can't contract this LL into an isosinglet, but I can definitely contract the LL into an isotriplet. So this is a doublet and another doublet. Two doublets either form a singlet, the singlet is zero, or they form a triplet. The triplet is not zero. It has the opposite symmetry. It's something that kind of looks like this. So if you're very picky, and remember these are all fermions, so nu nu is not zero, e e is not zero, and nu e is actually equal to e nu and not minus e nu. Once you take the the anti-commuting nature and the fact that these are Lorentz singlets into account, okay. So this is a triplet. It has hypercharge, as I mentioned. So this is not gauge invariant. It's actually doubly not gauge invariant because it has isospin, one, and it has hypercharge, minus one. So if I add to the theory a triplet Higgs, which has hypercharge plus one. Okay, so this is an object that looks like this. It has three components, which I'm calling T, and that's not the top quark, it's a triplet Higgs, it's a scalar. That's what the charges are, because it has hypercharge plus one. And remember the charge is the hyper, the third component of hypercharge plus one. Is that right? That sounds right. Yes. No, something like that. Yeah, that's right. Plus, yeah. Okay, so that's what, these are the charges. So I, I don't want to get too confused. And uh, we want to speculate that this triplet gets a VEV. And because we really like electromagnetism, uh, the triplet VEV has to look like that. Okay, and finally, the reason for writing this down is that if I, if I include in my Lagrangian something that looks like this, this is Lorentz invariant and it's gauge invariant. And again, your job is to figure out uh, what the SU2 structure of this is supposed to be, and it's easy, right? This is a triplet, this is another triplet, the question is, can I combine two triplets to form a singlet? And the answer is yes. So there's a question. It seems like the contraction other than the neutrino of the Weinberg operator gives something like WW to EE. That is correct. Or EW to EW. How can we relate the same scale for the neutrino mass with this? The answer is we can. And uh, these things are related to a neutrino less double beta decay. If you wanted to try to probe for stuff that looks like that. And uh, because the neutrino mass is so small, and because the effective value for, because lambda is so big, the contribution to processes like that one are really, really tiny. 
but you're, you're completely correct. You know, there is this uh, WW, so W minus W minus to E minus C minus scattering. You can look for that in an experiment. I would recommend doing it the other way around. You could look for E minus E minus scattering into WW. That's lepton number violating. But because my effective coupling lambda is so tiny, my effective coupling is one over lambda. Because that's so small, the cross section for that is just ridiculous. So that's why uh, uh, we don't often spend too much time talking about that in the context of just the effective operator. We can ask better questions once we have a UV complete model. Okay. So there's another question. Don't the new and the E anti commute? Absolutely. But remember, they're also contracted into Lorentz scalars. And the rule of contraction is that this is equal to that, not equal to minus that. It is equal to that once you take the Lorentz contraction into account. Okay, and again, uh, this is an important question, uh, but, but fortunately, our very compact notation knows about all of them. Okay, good. So this is my Lagrangian. It looks like this. After electric symmetry breaking, this term looks like that. And again, the neutrinos get a Majorana mass, which is great. So here we go, the neutrino got a Majorana mass. And uh, why isn't this the best model ever? Uh, the answer is it kind of is, uh, except it has a problem, which is if I go back to this operator, uh, I can say that U1 B minus L is conserved if the B minus L charge of the T is uh, two. So there's a question. Is the power in the lepton triplet supposed to be a half instead of one over square root of two? Uh, I don't see any power in the triplet. Oh, the lepton triplet here. Uh, I think it's one over square root of two, but I'm not so excited about learning this now. Uh, it's, the, it's whatever the klebsch gordon coefficient is supposed to be. Okay, how, can I explain again how we can write isotriplet out of LL? That's actually easy. And uh, let's think about spins that you learned in undergraduate quantum mechanics. I'm, I'm giving you a spin, a half object, and another spin, a half object. And then I'm asking you to combine those two spin, a half objects into a, a total spin. And there are two choices. Either the total spin is zero, or the total spin is one. The one that has total spin zero is anti-symmetric. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, okay, good. So this is not a power. This is a coefficient one over square root of two. Yeah, so the answer is what somebody wrote, which is uh, two times two is one plus three. So we know how to write down the one, that's the anti-symmetric combination. And we know how to write down the three, which is a symmetric combination which is why I instantaneously knew how to draw this, because if I remember anything about klebsch gordon coefficients, this is the up, up, down, down, up, down, plus, down, up. Oh, this is supposed to be down. One over square root of two. So is everybody happy with that? Uh, can I quickly repeat what you mean by a Lorentz singlet? Yes, that's the... A Lorentz singlet is, I remember, the new is a spin a half spinner. The, the new is another spin a half spinner. I'm not talking about isospin or anything. And if I want to write down a term in the Lagrangian, I have to combine them into a, a spin zero, right? Because the Lagrangian is Lorentz invariant. So that's what I mean. So that's what Lorentz singlet always means. It's something that I can write down in the Lagrangian. Okay, so let, let me let people ponder more about that. And I, and I guess you guys are also talking to yourselves. What is two and two times two? 
there's no two and two times two. Uh, two times, oh, that's a, sorry. That's a doublet, doublet. This is a singlet. This is a triplet. And again, the, the hope is that I'm appealing to how much you know about undergraduate quantum mechanics uh, using this SU2 language that you learned. OK? OK, so I'm not going to look at that. But yeah, that's, that's also correct. Yeah, so, so by the way, what somebody just wrote now, this three times three, uh, that's what's going on here. What I'm doing is I'm combining the two L's into a three. The triplet is another three. Three times three is one plus three plus five. And whatever this is, it's this one. Okay, and you can look up the Klebsch-Wharton coefficients for that. Or you can calculate them, you know, whatever your favorite way of doing that. Okay, but going back to the model, and the reason life is more complicated is, uh, so again, if I, you know, if you assign lepton number to T, then this is actually uh, uh, invariant under U1B minus L. That means that once the T gets a VEV, you spontaneously break The, oops, the U1 B minus L, which means there's a Goldstone boson. If you don't pay too much attention to that, but you really like phenomenology, that's very bad. A Goldstone boson means that there's some particle in the theory which is a scalar particle, a pseudoscalar, it doesn't matter, uh, which has zero mass. And, and again, that particle is not some exotic weird particle that lives somewhere, it lives here, okay? There's some particle inside of this T that has zero mass, which is super bad because I can look for an experiment that looks like this. You know, we know that the pi on, for example, decays into a muon and the neutrino. And if the neutrino couples to another neutrino, and a massless scalar, you can have a decay that looks like this. So here's my Goldstone boson. This, by the way, is a new bar, but nobody cares. So if I stare at this decay, this is a new version of pion decay. It's actually a very exciting version of pion decay because it's a three-body decay. So if I measure this muon here very well, I can place a constraint on the existence of this particle here. And, and I can completely rule out the existence of this particle if it's massless. So that means that spontaneously breaking U1 B minus L is bad. Now, uh, you don't have to think about it too hard to solve this problem because the problem solves itself. If you look at the scalar potential of this theory, it could contain a term that looks like this. And the H twiddle is the, the complex conjugate of the Higgs field. And the key thing to remember is that the H twiddle has the same gauge quantum numbers as the L. So if I can write down an LLT term, I can write down an H twiddle, H twiddle T term as well. And this is uh, interesting. It's a term in the potential. It's allowed by gauge invariance. And of course, because the Higgs has no lepton number, uh, if I try to assign lepton number to the T field, this is explicit lepton number violation. And that's good because it means that there's no Goldstone boson. That means that that guy gets a mass and that mass has something to do with this parameter kappa because in the limit where kappa goes to zero, I have the U1 B minus L restored. If the T gets a VEV, it spontaneously breaks the lepton number. That means that the mass of my, my particles are proportional to this kappa parameter in some sense. So the model people really, okay, so that's the end of that. Uh, let's do a little bit of phenomenology very quickly. One is, uh, 
the Higgs gets a VEV, the triplet gets a VEV, both of these contribute to the W mass and the Z mass. Uh, data tell us that the triplet VEV better be a lot smaller than the Higgs VEV, otherwise we would know about it, uh, just from electric precision data. There's things like the row parameters or the, the S parameter and the STU parameter and stuff like that. Is that right? I think that's, I get these confused. So that's one consequence of this. That's kind of nice because the neutrino mass has something to do with the VEV of the triplet. So if the triplet VEV is very small, uh, that's a nice hint that, uh, uh, that, that you can, uh, uh, that you get very small neutrino masses. So I wanna say a couple more things about this model. One is remember the triplet has friends. And this is a term in my Lagrangian. So that means that there is a coupling that looks like this. And this turns out to be a big problem uh, because if there was a scalar particle that coupled to two electrons in a way that violates lepton number, uh, we would definitely know about that. So there's a lot of interesting collider phenomenology you can do with this. So question, if the triplet vacuum expectation value is way smaller than V, it's easy to be, uh, I guess you're talking about early universe stuff. And uh, will that become a problem? Uh, I think you can work around that problem. I think the laboratory bounds are, yeah, so, so Again, you have to worry about what do the symmetries look like once in, in a background that has a very large temperature. And, and I think there are many things to worry about. Uh, but I think you can write in a self-consistent way. And then does the triplet Higgs lead to proton decay via higher dimensional operators? The answer is no, because the triplet Higgs doesn't violate baryon number. It's a good question. Uh, I, what The last thing I wanna say about the triplet before uh, uh, telling you why all the things that are very bad about the triplet from a, a, an experimental point of view. Uh, I should have said this already. This model is actually very, very predictive. If I include the flavor structure here as well, that's what the model looks like. So I actually get the neutrino mass matrix to be which is great because we know a lot about the neutrino flavor structure. That means that the neutrino flavor structure is directly related to these numbers here. So that means that not only do I have, a, you know, so as a function of the triplet VEV, I can predict what these numbers here are supposed to be with my flavor data. And this turns out to be a really big killer for this model. And again, remember this VT has to be kind of small it's not super small. It can be like, uh, I don't know, 100 MeV is fine, which means that these lambda Ts are not super tiny. They're small, but they're not super tiny. And the flavor structure uh, is actually governed by what we know about neutrino masses, which is great. But the problem is uh, people are very good at doing experiments. So I could do an experiment that looks like this, or uh, there's a physics process that looks like this. Uh, let me do this correctly. So I can mediate this uh, very weird muon decay. This is probably the minus minus guy. It doesn't matter because it can be going the other way. And uh, this gives me this very rare, never observed the muon decay. And uh, we haven't seen that either. And again, remember, because this model is so tied up, uh, you, you are often led to conclude uh, that we need this uh, triplet mass to be big. Okay, so 
So then there's another question. Uh, but if we break B minus L spontaneously and B plus L is anomalous, and there must be a loop graph that mediates proton decay, yes. And, uh, but we don't worry about that. That's uh, non-perturbative stuff. Finally, I was confused about the hypercharge assignment of the LLT term. How do we count the total hypercharge? So the T has hypercharge, remember, that's, the, that's a key point. So the, the LL has hypercharge minus one. And I said here that this guy has hypercharge plus one. So minus one plus one is zero. Okay. So the last thing I want to say about this model, because uh, that's not everybody's favorite model, is uh, if we're talking about the limit where the triplet mass is much, much bigger than the weak scale, just for the sake of argument, then uh, what I really should be doing is, is to integrate out this T and I actually get to draw a diagram that looks like this, L, L, H, H, and here's the triplet. Remember, the triplet has this kind of coupling to the leptons and this kind of coupling to the Higgs. So if I integrate out this particle, I get the Weinberg operator divided by some mass scale lambda. And here, one over lambda is kind of like a kappa over the triplet vev, the triplet mass squared multiplied by lambda t. So this is a lambda t. This is kappa, which is a dimension full coupling, by the way. It has dimensions of mass, and mt is a triplet mass. And that's why this is called a seesaw model. So that's good. It's called a seesaw model because in the limit, so again, I get the Weinberg operator, and lambda, or the neutrino mass, is inversely proportional to lambda. So the neutrino mass gets smaller as uh, the triplet mass gets bigger. So that's why it's called a seesaw model. So a seesaw means uh, I have a small mass in my theory that is a consequence of some other mass in the theory being very large. And it's a seesaw because one goes up and the other one goes down. I did not come up with this name, so don't blame me. Okay? So any more questions about the type two seesaw? So if there are no more questions about the type two seesaw, I want to talk about the type one seesaw because that one came first. And uh, that's probably the last thing I'll have time to talk about in some detail. So there's a type one seesaw. And this is a model we've already talked about or we've stumbled upon, which is uh, let's add my uh, left-handed antineutrino fields back into the story. Oh, so there was another question that came up. I think the standard model Higgs is different from T and both are scalars, that's correct. Then finally, if the T plus plus gets a zero VEV, gets a VEV, why do we worry about those decays? So the T plus plus cannot get a VEV, I think that's what this says, uh, but it's still a particle. So we can still exchange that particle and that's the thing that we worry about. Okay, so for the type one seesaw, I want to add back my right-handed neutrino, but I don't want to care about lepton number. So I want to write down the most general Lagrangian again. And I noticed, for example, that Kev talked about this today. And I think Lisa will probably talk about this this afternoon. And we already talked about that. So this is the most general Lagrangian that I can write down that contains this right-handed neutrino field or this left-handed antineutrino field. And the key point is that it violates lepton number because uh, this term in the Lagrangian wants to assign lepton number minus one to the right-handed neutrino. And this term in the Lagrangian wants to add a lepton number zero to the right-handed neutrino. So if both terms are present at the same time, 
uh, then you violate lepton number. Now, the key thing which I will spend most of the time talking about is M. And I already convinced you that if M is zero, then lepton number is good, and then the neutrinos are direct. Good, so we talked about that. So if M is not zero, then lepton number is broken. And then the question becomes, so what is M? So there's a question. In general, will M then U be a three by N matrix? Yes. And M will be an N by N matrix where N is a number of sterile neutrinos. Absolutely correct. Again, we live in a world where there's only one neutrino, at least for the most part, which is why I'm, I'm not talking about the flavor structure of that. Okay, so the question we ask is what is M? And the answer is we have no idea. And this is the, the most important message that I want people to take from this, is that we don't know what this number M is. And the key thing is that uh, uh, this number M is actually protected. And, and protected means uh, that if you add a certain value for the number M and you calculate quantum corrections to M, those quantum corrections are proportional to M. And the way of thinking about that is that M is a symmetry breaking parameter. That means if M were zero, the, uh, the, the symmetry of the Lagrangian is bigger. It contains lepton number. So that's the point. So quantum mechanically, we have no idea to, about what M is supposed to be. And the other thing is that M has nothing to do with the weak scale. This is both exciting, but it's also frustrating because uh, it's basically telling us that if you believe in right-handed neutrinos, but you're not a big fan of lepton number, then all of a sudden the standard model with massive neutrinos has another mass parameter in it. It is no longer true that everything is proportional to the Higgs valve we now have a new mass scale that we have to contend with. And it's completely unrelated to the weak scale. Unless, of course, you start speculating more. And that's what people do, right? So people really like to speculate. Uh, the first thing we can talk about is what happens if M is actually much bigger than the weak scale. Okay, in that case, I can integrate out the right-handed neutrino. So I get a diagram associated to it that looks like this. This is my right-handed neutrino. These are my L's. This is the Higgs. I noticed that somebody mentioned that we like to put a cross here, and that's actually true. And if you don't know what that means, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to the question in just a second. Uh, there is a, a quick and dirty way of convincing yourself of, of thinking about what the cross means. So remember when you have a when you have a fermion propagator, it looks like this. I always get the sign wrong, so don't tell me that I have the wrong sign. So just don't tell me. I don't want to know. But that's the propagator. The part of the propagator with the cross is this one. The part without the cross is the other one. That's all there is to it. Okay, so let's leave it at that. So the question is. So does this mean we don't need to treat the breaking of U1B minus L as a big deal? Uh, no, we don't. Uh, it's just a fact. Okay, and again, and the nice thing about whether B, B minus L is broken or not is that it's an experimental question. We can get the answer to that. I spend a lot of time talking about this because if you do break B minus L, then that symmetry really is just an accidental symmetry and it's not a big deal. On the flip side, if it is uh, uh, exact, then it is a big deal. So if you want to think about this, that's the other philosophical debate we're asking is what's the, what's the status of B minus L? Is that just a, a weird uh, accidental symmetry that gets broken a little bit or, or is it a fundamental symmetry of nature? Okay, so again, this gives you the Weinberg operator. And here, this number lambda 
is a neutrino Yukawa coupling squared divided by m. And by the way, this is where the cross comes in. Because I have a propagator, the propagator goes like 1 over m squared. But then, there, then I have an m in the numerator. And that's why it goes like 1 over m. And yes, u and v minus l is broken. Yeah. If the neutrino has a minor on a mass. OK. So this is what I can predict about this. So now I have this. I can turn this picture around, and I do like to write this down. And if I stare at this, I can ask more questions about my m. And basically, from this equation here, I can conclude that m is less than about 10 to the 15 GeV because we can't have the theory be very, very strongly coupled. And you can ask me about that later if you're confused about why can't my lambda be 100. Uh, but we can talk about that later. So that's what we learn. But I do want to emphasize that m can be much, much less than 10 to the, oh, sorry, 10 to the 14 GeV. OK, so that's a logical possibility. OK, so now I have to decide what to do in the next 10 minutes. And uh, what I do want to talk about is the, is the seesaw. And, and this, by the way, is also a manifestation of the seesaw mechanism, because the neutrino mass goes like lambda nu v squared divided by m. And again, the seesaw is here. That as this m gets bigger, this m gets smaller. OK. Oh, and so I have another homework problem for you, which is uh, if you go back to this Lagrangian, and this clearly is everybody's favorite subject, a new C can also be an SU2 triplet. So again, I can take the two doublets, which are the L and the H, and I can combine it with a triplet and not a singlet, and also get something in the Lagrangian. So new C can also be a triplet. And it still has a Majorana mass because the new C has no hypercharge. And you need to convince yourself of that. And whenever that happens, uh, you have what's called the type 3 seesaw, which looks exactly the same, except that in that case, the new C has both a charge plus and a charge minus component as well. And in principle, these are particles that you can study. So uh, a nice homework is for you to verify everything that I've just said. And then an even better question, I think, is uh, imagine that this triplet does not have the Majorana mass. Then lepton number is conserved. Then the neutrinos are Dirac. And the question is, why don't we talk about that model? What goes wrong with this uh, type 3 seesaw in the limit where the Majorana mass of the triplet uh, goes to 0? And again, Theoretically, everything works out fine, but, but phenomenologically, that model runs into all kinds of problems. So I, I want you to think about that. OK, so the last thing I want to do is to uh, talk about this model just a little bit more, and then I'll stop. So again, remember, my Lagrangian has the Uka coupling, and it has the my run a mass of the right-handed neutrinos. And of course, there's always the Hermitian conjugate. And what, I, what we want to do is to, what I did here was to integrate out the right-handed neutrino. Let's do something different. Let's see how does this look like after electroweak symmetry breaking. After electroweak symmetry breaking, my Lagrangian looks like this.
where this uh, MV is called the Dirac mass, which is just a lambda nu times V. Okay, so there's another question. Uh, and if, the, if it's a triplet, you have to ask, that's part of the homework problem, so I will not answer that. And, uh, and again, remember, if it's a triplet, it's an SU2 triplet, so it does not have three neutrinos. It has a neutrino, but it also has charged fermions in it as well. So uh, uh, it, it is something that I want you to think about a little bit more, but it's a good question. So coming back to this, after electric symmetry breaking, this is what my uh, Lagrangian contains. And I can write this term this way. And you can convince yourself that, that's, that that leads to the same Lagrangian as the one that I wrote down before. And you notice that uh, because my fermions are in general Majorana fermions, uh, they have this uh, off diagonal mass matrix that looks like this. So in order to get what are my fermions with a well-defined mass, they're gonna be mixtures or linear combinations of mu and nu c. Okay, so our job is going to be to uh, say something about this uh, matrix here. And that's what I'll talk about for the next five minutes and then I'll stop. Or, or maybe you can give me five more minutes because there's a, a lot of fun things you can say about this matrix. So let's, let me do that, okay? So again, the key thing is we have this matrix. And we want to diagonalize that. As somebody asked, this is a three plus n by three plus n matrix where n is the number of right-handed neutrinos. And in our world, we're pretending that it's a two by two matrix. Okay, so we're pretending that there's only one neutrino and one right-handed neutrino. So we want to diagonalize this matrix and uh, People like to talk about this, this in different limits. And the limit that I will spend most time on is uh, what happens if M is much, much bigger than MV? Okay. In this case, it's very easy to diagonalize this matrix. I'm gonna have a heavy mass, which is M. And I'm gonna have a light mass, which is minus MD squared over M. And again, this is all diagonalizing a two by two matrix. So let me look at this question before. Type two seesaw is realized by large Majorana mass M of nu C. No, that's the type one seesaw. Uh, no, we don't want large Majorana mass because of technical nature. No, we don't care about how big the Majorana mass is. It can be whatever we want. Uh, so it will be a bit unnatural to have large M even for right-handed neutrino. Okay, that's a great question. I do wanna say this again, even if it costs me all my time. So there are different things. Uh, do we have to do bi-unitary diagonalization? I will talk about that. The answer is no, because our mass matrix is a Hermitian matrix. Okay, and that's why we only get, we don't have to do bi-unitary diagonalization. Uh, I, Forget I said it's a Hermitian matrix, it's a symmetric matrix. It's definitely a symmetric matrix, and that's the thing that we have to diagonalize. Not unitary, um, not Hermitian, but symmetric. Okay, so going back to this model, uh, or even this model, so yeah. I have a model here that has a mass in it. This is a symmetry breaking parameter, and it can have any value you want it to have. It can be 10 to the minus 20 electron volts, or it could be the Planck scale. All of these are allowed. So if you want to say anything other than that, uh, you have to connect uh, uh, this model to observations. So for example, if you connect this model to observation, which I already talked about a little bit, we can conclude already this fact that this mass cannot be the Planck scale. It has to be less than the Planck scale. 
which is progress. Okay. Uh, what I hope to say is uh, we actually have other things we can say about this number m, and uh, that's what I hope to get to uh, in, in the next five minutes. But that only comes because of uh, uh, comparing this with data. So you can look at this in any way you want. Uh, this number m can be any number you want it to be. So I will let, let me just finish this. And then we can maybe talk about other stuff. But I, 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 just for completeness, I want to finish this limit here. And there's a heavy neutrino. How did that happen? OK. There's a heavy neutrino, which is mostly new C plus a little bit of new. And then there's a light neutrino, which is mostly nu plus a little bit of nu c. And I can calculate what this epsilon is. This epsilon is md over m. OK? So that's what we can do in this regime here. And uh, there's a lot of stuff that's exciting. So this number epsilon here. This here measures uh, active sterile mixing. Because again, from our perspective or the perspective of doing experiments, this new C is just some gauge singlet fermion. And the point is the heavy neutrino in the theory is mostly made out of the gate singlet fermion, but it has some small contamination of the regular, uh, uh, you know, SU2 doublet neutrino. So this is something that we can look for. And, and in that sense, it basically means that if this model is correct, there are more neutrinos. And I, okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll look at these in just a second. And the point is, even the heavy neutrinos have a non-zero probability of being uh, uh, made out of uh, uh, SU2 doublets. So in principle, you can look for them uh, in the laboratory as well. There's another way of writing down this number epsilon. And this number epsilon is at the square root of the light neutrino mass divided by the heavy neutrino mass. Or what people like to write down is that the active sterile mixing angle square, it's of order the light mass divided by the heavy mass. So that's something that you can predict. And it's something that you can go out and look for in the laboratory as well. OK? So uh, the very last thing, so anyway, uh, let me just think for one second. And I want to mention a couple of things, and then I'll stop. And, and that will hopefully take just, just about five minutes. So the key equations that we want to get out of this is this one. And we can take advantage of this equation combined with this equation to say something about this right-handed neutrino mass parameter. OK? So the very important thing is, uh, first of all, in order for this approximation to be true, this has to be true. But this is not a very restrictive statement. Because for example, I could take MV to be super tiny. And I could take M to be super tiny, but not as tiny. And, and this satisfies these conditions here, which means that all of these equations apply. So by taking advantage of this, you can ask, OK, could m be one electron volt? And the answer is yes, if the Dirac mass were super tiny, which requires a very small Yukawa coupling. And if that were the case, then you could look for these new heavy neutrinos via mixing via neutrino oscillations, because the typical mixing angle would not be so small. 
right? So if I had a combination that looks like these numbers here, then that could be, you know, maybe 1%. So there's another question. So I, 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 we can talk about flavor later. It only makes life complicated. Uh, the right-handed neutrinos don't have to have any E number or mu number or tau number. And that's actually good because we know that those quantum numbers are very, very severely broken because neutrino mixing is very, very strong. And uh, so once you start adding the flavor structure to this, uh, you can start making guesses about what these matrices should look like. And if you start doing that, that just restricts the forms of these matrices. But the whole story doesn't change. It only changes in the numbers. It changes in what kind of mixing angles you can get and stuff like that. And by the way, as somebody just said, we can always pick the M's to be diagonal. That's correct, because they don't have any charge left on friends. So you can always pick a basis where that, that statement is true. OK. So the point I wanted to make in, in negative one minutes is uh, that, OK, so I, I, read, I have to stop. So the very last thing I want to do is to make a plot. And then I'll stop. And this is M. This is the right-handed neutrino mass. And I'm going to put down some numbers here, 10 to the 15 GeV. And here is uh, 10 to the minus 9 electron volts. And so here's going to be one electron volt. And around here is like the weak scale. That's not to scale, by the way. So if you ask your experimental friends, what can we say about this number M? They basically tell you that uh, it can't be less than about one electron volts. So everything here is allowed. And remember, this is the key equation. And if you ask your theory friends, anything less than 10 to the 15 is actually also allowed. And then there's one last piece to the puzzle, which is uh, it turns out that anything less than 10 to the minus 9 electron volts is also allowed. So here the neutrinos were called pseudo Dirac, and I didn't have time to talk about that. This part of the parameter space is actually ruled out. So that's how far we've gotten. And the reason I'm saying this as the last thing I want to say is uh, this is to give you a sense of how limited or how much or how limited is the information from measuring the coefficient of this operator. And the main point is that I can have a new particle that has a mass that's anywhere between one electron volt and 10 to the 15 GeV, and I get a good fit to the data. So the final thing I want to say is that if you want to learn more about neutrino masses, we need more data. Now, you could ask me, what kind of data do you need? What kind? And the answer is, uh, we're not sure. It depends. Which is why we have to do all different kinds of experiments of all different types in order to start seeing some other evidence of the physics of non-zero neutrino masses. OK, so I, I, I should stop here because I've gone over time already. Thank you. OK, thank you, Andre. Um, I know a lot of people have asked a lot of questions during the lecture, but it looks like there's some more coming up right okay. now. So I think I addressed uh, the fact that M can be diagonal. So let me say this a little bit more slowly. If you look at this Lagrangian here, and you take the flavor structure into account, and you allow this M to be an n by n symmetric matrix, 
Uh, you can convince yourself that you can pick a basis where M is diagonal. And the only thing that that does is to screw up your neutrino yuka coupling. It makes your yuka coupling not diagonal. But it wasn't diagonal anyway, so nothing changes. Okay, so that's, that's one comment that was made here, which is correct. And then the last question is, why is a scenario where the Majorana mass much lighter than the Dirac mass ruled out? So that's something I didn't get to talk about, which is uh, if it's really, really, really smaller than the Dirac mass, it's not ruled out. So if you live here, this is allowed. The part which is ruled out is here. So it's a very restricted part. And in order to understand that, uh, if you live over here, this is ruled out because the, the mixing between uh, active neutrinos and sterile neutrinos is so large that we would have seen it by now. If you live over here, then you have this scenario of what's called the pseudo Dirac neutrinos, which is the opposite exercise of diagonalizing this matrix when M is a lot smaller than M Dirac. So that's when you get the pseudo Dirac neutrinos. And what happens here, which is kind of interesting, is that in that scenario, the, I'll, I'll, I'll say something about that. Uh, in, in that scenario, the mixing is huge. It's actually a 45 degree mixing, but the differences between the masses are super tiny. So if you want to start looking at these pseudo Dirac neutrinos, you have to look at neutrino oscillations with very large mixing, but a very long wavelength. And when you get to a wavelength, which is associated to this number, then the wavelength is bigger than the Earth-Sun distance, which means you can't constrain that even by studying the oscillation of neutrinos coming from the Sun. Okay, so there are two more questions. In the type two case, do we get a new hierarchy problem for T? Yes, we do, it's the same one, but it's a different manifestation of the hierarchy problem. And then finally, the last question is, what's a pseudo Dirac neutrino? A pseudo Dirac neutrino is one where this is happening, where the Majorana mass of the, of the right-handed neutrino, this one, is a lot less than the Dirac mass. The reason it's called pseudo Dirac is the following thing, which I didn't have time to say, but if you look at this mass matrix and you make M equals zero, you can still diagonalize it. So in that case, let me write it in some other color. If M is zero, you have two masses. You have uh, M plus, which is M Dirac. And then you have M minus, which is minus M Dirac. And you have two neutrinos. You have the nu plus is a one over square root of two, nu plus nu C. And then you have the nu minus, which is one over square root of two, nu minus nu C. So this here, it's just a really complicated way of writing down the Dirac neutrino with mass M. And this is a statement that people like to make, which is uh, you can think about a Dirac neutrino as two, uh, sorry, you can think about a Dirac fermion as two Majorana fermions with equal and opposite mass, which are 50-50 uh, mixtures of, of two other states. So that's, what a, so that's what a Dirac neutrino is. A pseudo Dirac neutrino is something that almost looks exactly like that, but it's a little bit split. So that's what this little, that's what M in the small limit does, is that it takes your Dirac neutrino and splits it just a little bit. And for the most part, that state still behaves like a Dirac neutrino, but not really. It's a little bit different. That's why it's called pseudo Dirac. Okay, so one last question, which is, wouldn't a big mixing between sterile and active neutrinos screw up the PM and S unitarity? It absolutely would. And that's why this region of the parameter space is ruled out because it totally screws that up. And it also gives you hope for probing a little bit more of the parameter space because if you're living here, you expect your new mixing angles to be large because you know, in that case, M is not so big. So M over M is not so small. Actually, I wrote this the other way around, clearly. So this is wrong. Sorry about that. So 
if the seesaw scale is ridiculously low, you can actually learn about that by looking at things like violation of unitarity of the uh, MNS matrix. So finally, one last thing. I don't understand the pseudo direct region then. What happens is uh, if I am in the pseudo direct regime, I can still probe these things by mixing. But as the capital M gets smaller and smaller, the new mass square difference that you're inducing is also getting smaller and smaller. So that means that the wavelength of the new oscillation that you can look for is getting longer and longer. If that oscillation length gets too big, you know, so basically think about two levels that are almost degenerate, but not really. And as M gets smaller and smaller, they become more degenerate. As they become more degenerate, the oscillation that you can look for uh, starts becoming longer and longer. And once that oscillation gets longer than the size of the solar system, we can't do any experiment here on Earth that could ever probe that. And the bound for that is, is at a mass which is around 10 to the minus 10 electron volts. So that means that uh, if the M is way too small, then, then there's no laboratory experiment you can do, including the measurement of solar neutrinos, that can tell you that that's the case. You have to look for neutrinos that are coming from even further away, like a supernova explosion. And some people get excited about that, and they write papers about it. So if you want to study pseudo direct neutrinos, you have to start thinking about super long oscillation lengths, which are way bigger than the solar system. I hope this helps. OK, fantastic. I think, okay. oh, maybe one more. And then we, and then we call it a lunchtime. Uh, so you can call it whatever you want. Uh, but it's better to call them pseudo the rack because the key point is as long as this number M is not, capital M is not zero, they are definitely Majorana fermions, strictly speaking. So strictly speaking, they are always Majorana fermions if this uh, capital M is not zero. Even if it's 10 to the minus 30 electron volts. We call them pseudo the rack because even though they are Majorana fermions, they behave like the rack fermions. So I think that's usually how the, the language gets used. Okay, fantastic. So let's give Andre um, a big thanks for these excellent lectures. Um, we've got the coffee break now uh, in about an hour and a quarter from now, and then the last lecture of the day starting at two o'clock Tassi time, and the discussion session after that. Yeah, All right, and, take care everybody. And I'll try to sign up for room E, like, like I did uh, on, on Monday and Tuesday. So if people want to ask more questions,